for for one thing I am not an actor and I don't play one in the graveyard but I do like the story of Daniel Bandman Daniel Bandman was buried in this lowly grave uh, on a Sunday afternoon in November in 1905 and um, to do the do him justice um, I'd like to read parts of a, the obituary that appeared on that same day on page 9 in the New York Times. The headline read, Daniel Bandman dead. Years ago, he was one of the most noted figures on the stage. Dateline, Missoula, Montana. Daniel Bandman, a Shakespearean actor of note and one of the best residents of Montana, best known residents of Montana, dropped dead at his ranch near here last night of heart failure brought on by acute indigestion. Daniel Edward Bandman was for many years a picturesque figure, although his professional career ended 15 years ago. In his time, he played many parts, visited many lands, and was the central figure in no end of troublesome professional and personal experiences, all of which make a lot of good stories. A book which he wrote many years ago describes at length his experiences in a trip around the world. He was born 65 years ago at Kassel, Germany and made his professional debut at the age of 18 at the Court Theater of New Strelitz in Germany. After considerable experience on the continent, he acted for the first time in English on January 15, 1863 at Niblo's Garden in New York as Shylock. He remained in the United States for a number of years, appearing in a tragic repertoire, including Hamlet. <laughs> um, it goes on to talk about his trips around the world and his uh, various wives. Fifteen years ago, Bandman bought a ranch near Missoula, Montana, and there he, was re there he has remained ever since. New York actors who happened to play in the little one-night stand were frequently impressed with the figure of a grim, shaggy-haired, stern-browed old man sitting in the first row and watching their performances with keen and penetrating interest. It was Daniel Bandman. He never lost his interest in the stage and always made it a point to go behind the scenes and talk about old times with the players who happened to drift to the faraway Montana village quite a lengthy obituary in the New York Times on November 25th, uh, 1905. Um, a couple of stories to kind of illustrate um, who Dan Daniel Bandman was. Are you Daniel? Yes. Of great. Yeah, yeah. Great. You're, it's a dead ringer. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, let me tell you about this guy. <laughs> For one thing, it's remarkable that you came after a lifetime of acting on plays from all around the world, Broadway, London, Australia, and became a rancher in Missoula, Montana. A horticulturalist. And more importantly, a horticulturist. Right. The ranching didn't work out That's very right. well. That's right. <laughs> I'm not even sure if the, the apples did either. But uh. <laughs> the um, one of the that was that question was asked of him in an interview in 1902, and he his answer was, "I was willing to give up the living of a metropolitan life to the trying struggles, the uncertain results, and vicissitudes." of a Montana rancher in those days. I knew nothing of stock, but I loved it. I knew nothing of poultry, but I loved it. I knew nothing of pigs, but yes, I loved them too. They always seemed to me so much like my fellow men, full of greed, greed, greed. And was I not greedy too? Didn't I want land and lots of it? <laughs> I loved the rural life and everything which was associated with nature but I was to pay for plunging headlong into it and for my lack of knowledge in human nature. Uh, quick background, he first started buying the ranches that make up Bandman Flats today um, in 1887. 1893, of course, was one of the biggest economic um, 
downturns. Meltdowns, downturns <laughs> in American history, probably next to the Great Depression in the 1930s. So he was trying to build up his ranch at the time that particular um, depression happened. And um, this may be the result. This graves, this lowly gravestone or headstone that doesn't even spell his name right. He's missing one of the N's in Bandman. Um, Though my son uh, took, uh, took that spelling of the name. Later on? Yes. Is that right? Yeah. He ended up as a Bandman with only one N. And your son died, was less my than a year son, old, right? My youngest son was born about three weeks before I died. And he died in 1994. The family ended up moving to Spokane. Um, my, my last wife, uh, Louise, uh, Mary? Mary. 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 And uh, uh, another um, couple of daughters uh, all ended up in the Spokane area. It's not surprising you forgot the name of one of your wives. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, there's more to tell on that. <laughs> well, um, he was... Um, we've had, in western Montana and the Missoula area, we've had actors and actresses who move here probably to stay out of the limelight. I'm thinking Andy McDowell and John Lithgow and probably many others that we never hear about. When Daniel Bandman retired to Missoula, um, staying out of the limelight was not on his agenda. He, um, not only did he continue acting, um, and in fact did some nationwide vaudeville tours in the early 1900s, but he was constantly in, uh, in the limelight in Missoula. Here's, here's an example. Um, on a June, late June Saturday night in 1889, Bandman was speaking, uh, got into a conversation with some of the locals, and he, got, he made them a bet. He th said that he could walk from downtown to the top of Mount Sentinel and back in two hours. And um, this, this generated... No problem, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> he was 1889, he was born in roughly 1840, so he was, he was getting on in, in years at that time, but he was a notorious, or he was a famous for his walking. He um, set out near the Higgins Avenue Bridge, and um, they, he called it a, a six-mile trip, or the newspaper that documented it called it a six-mile trip back to the top of Mount Sentinel and back. Now, whether he had somebody along with him to document that he actually made it to the top, I, the newspaper report didn't say, but he left at 6.30 in the evening, and under the eyes of hundreds of people downtown, and as the two hours were passing, the excitement became so high that a number of side bets were made. And this was, this was the report from the Missoulian at the time. Bandman surprised even his most sanguine, sanguine friends, making the trip in an hour and 40 minutes. 600 men were on the bridge when the race ended and cheered the winner vociferously. If I recall my English teacher, and you know who that was, I've heard rumors. Yes. When I came to New York, he would have said sanguine. Sanguine. Okay. There you go. But when I came to New York, I came and, and was acting in a German, in a, the Stadt Theater in New York. It was a German-speaking theater mm -hmm. my first year. But I didn't want to just leave it at that. I had already entered into the Shakespearean world, and I wanted to learn English. So I went, and I was in New York City, and I... Uh, went to Cooper Union for English classes, and my teacher was Alexander Graham Bell. So it was about 12 years before that little invention called the telephone That's came correct. along. That's correct. Another story that he liked, loved to tell, and again, I cannot vouch for its truth, but uh, this got into se several publications. This was during the 1990s. His ranch, sat where the golf, where Canyon River Golf Course sits now. His, the ranch house was on this end, toward the East Missoula end of that. And the bridge to get there, 
was the old Northern Pacific Railroad trestle, uh, parts of which are still uh, t still visible. Uh, the black tee, the back tee on the f number five on Canyon River, is the eastern approach of the of that bridge. But at that time, Daniel bought the bridge from the Northern Pacific and used it as a toll bridge, charging people so they didn't have to make the torturous drive over Marshall Grade when they were going from Missoula to Bonner and back. And um, that the bridge was fairly popular because people wanted to, would, would pay the toll, but um, the native Indians who had for years used that flats as a campground refused to pay the toll. They just showed up on his, on his yard, lawn, on his, in his yard at times. And um, one of, one of um, Bandman's chief uh, attempts at ranching at that time were, was a rare breed of chickens. And a super royal blooded chickens that he um, somehow started missing. And while there were coyotes and other predators, weasels abounding, he suspected it was more of the two-legged variety of predator that was decimating the flock. They would set up their camp, as he told it, and uh, the chickens would wander through the teepees, and somehow they'd find snares on the ground that, uh, and disappear. That's, this was his story, and he was sticking to it. The Indians protested their innocence, but Bandman exhausted his vocabulary to get the uninvited guests to move on. So he formulated a plan. When the next caravan of Indians arrived, they began unloading, set, getting ready to set up camp, and uh, his, their dogs were scampering through his livestock. Bandman went backstage, back into his house, and when he appeared, this is what he looked like. He had a foot-high black silk stovepipe hat with the fringes of a red wig sticking out. <laughs> Mustache that was waxed in a horizontal position and parallel to fushy, bushy false eyebrows. He had a red shirt that showed through the open French Albert coat and a green scarf around his neck and pinstripe trousers and high-heeled boots. As he exited the house, he placed a double-barreled shotgun at the bottom of the steps. And he strode toward the teepees, tipped his hats, hat and began to complain in a low voice. He gently chided the Indians who were gathering in a group to, to smile at his strange actions. Suddenly, he began to spout dramatize parts from Shakespeare. Who knows which parts? He went from one language to another. He gave, he gave, uh, Shakes he recited Shakespeare in his native German, in English, and in French. And he went from one to the other for this performance. His eyes popping and squinting through the false eyebrows. The Indians were spellbound and then, but Bandman wouldn't let them leave. As he reached his climax, he dropped his voice to a gentle tone, took a few steps toward the house, and said, Pray do not leave. Wait, I will return with my shotgun. <laughs> As he turned around, he disappeared back into the house, and looking out the window with a friend, he saw the Indians scattering, gathering their belongings, and heading for the hills. And he asks his friends, how is my Shakespeare? And his friend says, never better, but you've lost your audience. <laughs> and he concluded, this is a personal tribute I will never forget. Words have saved my kingdom where the shotgun would have failed. <laughs> One last story and then I'll be done. <laughs> um, he was a founding member, or at least an important member of the Montana Horticultural Society. Um, probably best known for championing the Macintosh apple. Um, and the 
Montana Horticultural Society had its annual meeting in 1903 in Stevensville. And at, uh, there was a standing room only in the hall at Stevensville to see Bandman and his wife, Mary, entertain the people with Shakespearean recital. Bandman started out by reading Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. You'd think I could memorize that much, at least. <laughs> I never could either. <laughs> <laughs> the audience kind of tittered at first, according to Morton Elrod, the professor from the university who was, who was telling this story later on. But with his rendition of the word nevermore, as only Bandman could give it, by the time the recital was ended, the room was as still as, that, the, as any that I have ever been in, said Elrod. The next day was the end of the meeting. They, were, they met, uh, the committee was thanking everybody for doing their part to put on this annual gathering. Um, he thanked the people of the members, the officers, the band that had played, the people of Stevensville, and even the railroads. And as he, compl as he finished, they, he was barely finished when Mr. Bandman rose to his feet, according to Martin Elrod. He says, Mr. Chairman, I move that we extend a vote of thanks to Mr. and Mrs. Daniel E. Bandman for the very excellent entertainment that was given in the hall last evening. And as he took his seat, Elrod heard him say, the damn fools, they don't know their manners. I'll teach them. Well, thanks. That's Daniel Bandman. There's more. You get an idea of what he's like. There. Uh, Daniel Bandman was an inspiration, actually, to my father, who wrote a poem about oh. about Daniel Bandman. Cool. May I uh, read? It? I think it's relevant to. Relevant. Uh, oh, I'd, I'd <laughs> love to. Can I? Do, <laughs> Okay. After, after I retired from the university, uh, I just sat down. I felt like uh, putting some of my memoirs, uh, historical memoirs, mainly of my Montana experience, uh, starting in 1949 when I uh, joined the faculty of botany at the, at the university. And uh, uh, Brian Thornton, the manager of the bookstore, came up with this name for my booklet of poems. You know, cowboy poetry was sort of this the rage at the time, in the uh, early 80s, I guess, uh, he came up with the name yippee I yiddish And uh, <laughs> a subtitle from the Bronx, B-R-O-N-C-S, to the big sky. <laughs> so, and that, could, that uh, could, describes my saga. Could you identify yourself? Oh, I'm uh, Mike Chesson, Meyer Chesson, Mike Chesson, as uh, my students used to know me. And uh, I taught here from 49 until 1980 and been retired uh, since and um, put this little booklet together and uh, since it's uh, relevant to the to the topic here I'll I'll uh, make a quick reading I wish I could recite it from uh, you know from heart but I haven't yeah. I haven't done that <coughs> and it's called Shakespeare and the Garden City just a few miles east of Missoula, there's a spot that's called Bandman Flats. Though a bull pasture now, was before the Canyon Estates, though a bull pasture now in the past, in the past white-tailed deer, and at night, perhaps, a few bats. I wondered for long how that place got its name, till I found in a roundabout way, there had been a Bandman whose first name was Daniel who'd sought refuge in the old USA. He had to leave Germany, like so many others, after the blow up in 48, that's 1848. Arrived in our West at 63, 1863, and went to the mining camp straight. But it wasn't until 1890, Daniel Bandman discovered this place. Believe it or not, here at that early date, a Shakespearean active actor you'd face. Yes, he started a school for actors before the century turned, and he planted our very first fruit trees. 
as widespread respect he had earned. So here's to one of our first pioneers who helped to establish this town. Let's remember our own Daniel Bandman. Let's keep his a name of renown. Thank you. Good job. One thing we one thing we should do is make sure his name gets spelled right again. <laughs> <laughs> we have to check with him. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs>